cool. Okay, we've got ourselves recording. And I'll just give it a few minutes so that people can kind of funnel in. Joseph, do you want to bring your presentation up just to make sure that we can do that smoothly? <laughs> we should have done that in our practice session. Too busy talking. No problem. Um, oh, share screen. The obvious one right there. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Here. Nice. There we go. How's that? Yeah, that's a great photo. Beautiful. Day. Yeah. You want me to stop the share or just start from there? Um, depends on what you want to do. I'll just do a brief introduction once we get um, here in just two minutes or so, and then we can roll into your presentation. So whichever you prefer. Okay. Well, while I got it up, I'll just leave it. Then. <laughs> that's probably easier. <laughs> Okay, everybody, we're going to give it like two more minutes and then we'll get started. So if you have any snacks or coffee breaks you need to do, you might as well do that now. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. So this is our sixth episode of our summer webinar series, and I'm super excited to have Joseph Brinkley on today. I met him in Arkansas this summer at a Green America um, conference, and I had the fortunate opportunity to try some of Bonterra's organic wine there and um, also take some home. And I still have some, but I forgot to bring the bottle to work today, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but yeah, super excited to have this conversation today. We're going to just briefly go over some of the practices that distinguish Bonterra and then um, delve into more of a conversation about how to actually market a regenerative organic product. So a little introduction for Joseph. He has a degree in horticulture and another in economics, and he has 15 years of experience in the field. Joseph specializes in soil health, farming efficiencies, compost, cover crops, biodynamic farming and viticulture, and regenerative organic farming and responsible business practices. He is instrumental in shaping and driving Bonterra Organic Estates or advanced policy positions in climate smart agriculture and business practice and has advocated to lawmakers for climate action and healthy soils legislation in California and Washington, DC. Um, we are going to go ahead and pass it on over to Joseph and he's going to give us a brief presentation and then we'll delve more into the conversation side of things. And briefly too, I just wanna introduce Davis. Davis is on our sales team here at Green Cover. Um, Davis and I are both calling in from Bladen right now, and um, Davis has been doing a bunch of work with our orchard and vineyard customers, and he has been doing some traveling and um, relation building in California recently, so he's going to have some insight to share with us today. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Great to be here, and um, I, yeah, give a little overview of what we do, kind of how and why. 
um, maybe some of the practices more specifically, and then I uh, look forward to the discussion, conversation. So we, Bontero Organic Estates, we farm about 900 acres or 900 acres under vine in the North Coast, Mendocino County, uh, California, inland Mendocino County between Hoplin and Ukiah, basically. Uh, we've been farming organically since 1988, or CCF certified, I should say, since 1988. We were the 2016 Wine Enthusiast American Winery of the Year, which was quite exciting for us being uh, an, an organic producer. Um, that, that was a big, a big deal. Uh, and then last year in 2021, we quite sure were the largest um, vine vineyard and winery in the United States to receive the regenerative organic certification. And then just one more note of certifications. Uh, so the corporation itself is certified B Corp. Fonterra and Fetzer Brands are certified climate neutral. We have the true zero waste, fish friendly farming. Um, the list goes on and on, but but I, I think this just kind of sums up the, the the dedication to the practices of really trying to make a positive impact and benefit and certifying those claims. So starting out here, um, as I said, we're excited. So I'm going to put the banner up. 100% um, of our, our, our estate vineyards in Mendocino County and the entire winery facility received the, the silver level of the regenerative organic certification. Um, we started with organic. Uh, we were doing biodynamics now for 20 plus years. Um, and this new certification that we saw, we really thought it was important to, again, for us, making backing it up with a third party audit of that claim for the transparency and the consumer confidence really at the end of the day. So we really feel important on the regenerative organic. You know, I'd, I'd argue that we've been practicing this for, for many years now with, under the, the pretext really of biodynamic farming. Um, so a lot of the, the soil focus and soil practices are, are similar. Um, and then of course the benefits, right? There's there's benefits here that we all are probably quite familiar with, the, the soil health, um, biodiversity, and really the climate resilience. So outside of our own farming, well, I guess in addition to, we've, we've been for a few decades now partnering with research institutions um, or even private companies focused on research. And so the most recent one that I'm highlighting here are, are really a, around the, the farming management practices and how that impacts the capacity of the soil to store organic, soil organic carbon. And so we, we this is a multi-year project um, taking a bunch of soil samples and plant samples, uh, plant tissue to see where where the shift happens year over year in, in, in carbon, whether it's the woody plant tissue or below ground. And here's a quick little um, mention of the, the difference as based, if conventional farming neighbors was the baseline, which is where we started um, as far as the samples go, then we look to see the organic and the biodynamic stores and excuse me, soils and the increase in storage from there as highlighted here. And you can find more here on the, the soil study. Given that we have a marketing kind of bent to, to the the webinar today, the, the discussion, and I am clearly not a marketer, but I wanted to just bring up here in a, in a couple of different areas the, that it's important how we communicate. So yes, we did the research. Yes, we've published papers or the the uh, company that we, we teamed up with actually did. Uh, but here is, is kind of a nice infographic um, of how to communicate these things to, to the consumer and, and to our partners and such. So, you know, a lovely little infographic here, conventional organic biodynamic, the soil organic carbon store, you know, a lovely little E to read. And then here on the other side, um, a few kind of important points about the study and makes it easy to digest versus reading the whole paper. So if we take a step, one step removed maybe from our own farming. And so Bonterra as a brand, we are nearing right around the 600,000 case mark. Um, so we've, we've grown from about 200,000 cases and about 10 or so years ago to, to 500,000 and approaching six now. 
Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that 100% of our fruit does not come from our for the Bonte brand. Therefore, there's a fair amount of fruit that's sourced from other farmers within California. And so we set a goal that by 2020, at least 90% of our of the vineyards we were sourcing from were certified sustainable for all the sourcing needs and organic or biodynamic for the Bonterra um, organic line and the needs there. And, you know, we, th we think this is really important that we work with our uh, sourcing partners really to help educate, to help answer questions, to help bring them along the journey as well. And then one more step out. Um, we've, we've focused uh, quite a bit in the last three to four years now on, on advocacy. So we realize that, you know, we can all do our part consumers as producers. At some point, the climate price is such that we really need strong policy. Uh, we need policymakers to, to make some, some smart and strong decisions to support our regenerative farming and regenerative farming in, in, in DC um, and in Sacramento state and national wide for, for policies to support regenerative farming. And quickly our approach, um, just real quick, you know, I think the one thing to remember is, is I've called this keys to creating healthy systems. This little fruit fly really wants to join y'all, um, wants to say hi. Not only in the business practice, but also the farm or vice versa in the farm and in the business practice. We're really talking about healthy systems, creating and maintaining healthy systems. And, and I see there's basically four components to this. It's how we build relationships, maybe build and maintain. Maybe I should have said relationships, um, the farm and the business, you know, promoting biodiversity. We know that biodiversity brings an incredible amount of strength to the farm and the business, um, honoring complexity. Clearly, when we try to boil down a cause and effect from like a A to B kind of reductionist way, it, it we miss a lot, especially in a living system, something as complex as the farm and how we interact in, in our uh, in our local ecosystem. And really, we're, we're encouraging resilience. And I think the practices that we'll speak to later are, are really for encouraging or creating this resilience in the system. This graphic, sorry for the colors, it's like Easter colors. Um, this is not my expertise as PowerPoint colors. But anyways, what, what I'm trying to show here is that the farmer basically, we stand inside these overlapping circles, right? So in the most grandest context, you really have climate and weather and patterns and cycles and such. Um, I guess I, I forgot about the, the universe um, outside of this circle but as we come down now we, we look at kind of the natural elements that that basically you you have to work with on, on the farm on the piece of land that you're stewarding um and then kind of a, a smaller circle within that would be the native flora and fauna right there's native trees i i'm from virginia i'm looking out i'm in virginia at the moment and um versus california right the the native landscape is quite different so how can we manage that and the farmer, of course, is, is there in the center of, of all this, trying to make the right decisions. Another way, I think, to look at it is, is as a farmer, we have the capacity to, to influence certain, certain areas or the areas of influence have the capacity to impact our farms, our production. Uh, it says you can now see my screen, so hopefully you didn't miss all those. Um, so here are the, some of the more important areas that I think are, are really the tillage or the reduction there of um, irrigation, depending on, of course, your region, how we manage compost, um, biodynamic preparations, if, if that's your trajectory. Uh, of course, cover crop choices. I certainly can't leave out cover crops to a green cover audience. Uh, for us, how we integrate animals into the system. And then of course, inputs, you know, inputs, I think get a lot of attention and have for quite a while, but, but they're just one part of the, the whole puzzle inputs being fertilizers and, and, and pesticides or besides and such. So I've said regenerative ag, or at least it's been on the slide about six times now. Um, so what is it really? So I figured I'd, I'd try to couple find a couple definitions. This one comes from the Regenerative Agriculture Initiative out of California State, um, Chico. And really, I think the, the important pieces here, really it's a, obviously an agricultural approach, a system 
but typically within the regenerative definition, you find some something around climate change. How can agriculture become or continue to be a part of the solution? Um, and it's really around carbon. You know, that's often what sets this idea of regenerative agriculture apart. Here said another way by this uh, site called the Carbon Underground. Um, really, I think it's it is a, it's a holistic land management. And that's one of the things that we see that has in common with say biodynamics and other approaches is that it's really a, a holistic kind of approach, systems approach, and leveraging the power of photosynthesis. So, given that amazing power of photosynthesis, I think this could probably take, well, you've heard from Dr. Christine Jones, so this isn't new, um, but to me, this is this is magic right here. I, I'm not a fan of sequestration as far as a mm, verbiage goes, so I prefer reintegration because we're really not locking it away, right? Carbon's incredibly useful. We're just trying to take it from the atmosphere, which is not all that beneficial for our time. I return it to the soil, which is basically where it came from, where it is incredibly beneficial. For me, it's a, a mystical process, really. I mean, it's remarkable that with sunlight and water and air, plants provide the sustenance for the above and the below ground life on Earth. It's absolutely remarkable and I think overlooked oftentimes. Really, obviously, the plants are creating the nourishment for the soil life and the above soil life. And for us, really it's utilizing this relationship again with ruminants because ruminants and grasses and forbs have this incredible incredible relationship and, and dynamic interaction um, where the cycle is is repeated so i'd say basically here are some principles really you know how can we how can we go about integrating animals into the system while minimizing the disturbance and really increasing that photosynthetic capacity along with the rest of them i'm not going to read you all the words to the slide i can't stand that when somebody reads to me i can read so i'm not going to bore you with the words but really it's how can we utilize these cover crops and animals and that's what i'm going to focus on here in the last few slides um, so we can get to this discussion for us you know, there's kind of four areas here that, again, the farmer stands in the middle of, I would say. It's, it's the animals, the, the compost, um, the preparations, if, if that's your trajectory again, and then the cover crops. And so here we go. Let's talk about, um, oops, I forgot, another infographic for the marketing piece, how we communicate these practices. You know, there's basically six of them um, or six practices or approaches as far as avoiding synthetic inputs as well as, as one of those being regenerative organic. Um, for me, the cover crops, really, this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking for a diversity in form and function. These are kind of the four components, maybe the four buckets that we're, we're pulling from for a nice mix. You can see that perhaps maybe this is early season, uh, you see the vine with just broken bud, you know, a few weeks prior, is after the sheep have been through a few times, um, the regrowth. And we're really looking at how do we grow living soil between the carbon, the air, and water. And that's one of the key elements of, of cover crops and their interaction with our, with our uh, animal friends. Integrating animals, of course, here this, you know, for us, it's really about a living fertility. So it's the, the micro life in the rumen or in the, the metabolic soil. Um, and in some ways, we really see that that gives them another sense expression for the farm system as a whole. I think real quick, I'm going to wrap this up so we can have a discussion. It's not just me talking at you folks here. Um, these are a few kind of practical uses that we found for the sheep, the mowing, you know, grazing, but really in place of a tractor, the undervine, the middles, um, we can use them for leafing, for dam vegetation. We have some dams that are managing the vegetation there and cool. So here's clearly where the sheep have been and where they're about to go. You know, you can see the difference there. 
uh, here. It's just a quick, a brand, a relatively new vineyard. See the grow tubes, no sheep. Here they come going through, and then within a matter of a handful of days, this is where we're left, you know. So it certainly is, is well grazed. Um, and they took off a couple grow tubes, but no big deal. All right, I think that's all I have for now. And maybe we could get to this discussion here. Awesome. Thank you, Joseph. Um, one of the, first of all, I really love the way that you described photosynthesis as a mystical and dynamic process. I really do think that having the emphasis on what is actually happening there. I mean, we learn about it in like what, second grade or third grade, <laughs> kind of have like a basic understanding of it our entire lives, but really to stop and appreciate how magnificent of a process that is. And we rely upon that process for our survival. So I thought that was cool that you highlighted that. Um, yeah, and I and two, one of the things that you said about um, uniquely integrating ruminants made me think about the first webinar that we had in this series with Dr. Stefan van Vliet, where he talked about how ruminants have the capacity because they have a rumen to eat grass. And then we as human beings have the capacity to intake nutrients from grass that we wouldn't be able to digest on our own through that process. And so I think, again, that's just another complexity and nuance to the entire thing that is just mind blowing for me. <laughs> um, okay, so you said that 100% of the vineyards are rock certified um, out of the vineyards that you source grapes from. What was that process like? And can you just kind of walk us through the expansion and how you, how you went about trying to source those grapes and what the certification process was like. Did you find those vineyards that were already certified or did you work with vineyards to get them certified? Right, so, so to clarify, the ROC certification, the regenerative organic is 100% of the estate. In, in the vineyard world, estate would mean just what we're farming. Oh, okay. So 100% of the, essentially like the internal vineyards are ROC certified then everything that we're sourcing outside of what we're growing for Bonterra is organic certified, okay. not necessarily rock though. So um, yeah, just, just to clarify that hundred percent is organic and in, in what we've done thus far. And, and we, there's others coming on into the program and interested and, and we hope to continue to be a resource to help others um, continue with that. But I just want to clarify that I'm happy to talk through the, the process of, of rock. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want to give the indication here that we're, we've like helped to convert everyone to rock all of a sudden <laughs> but for us you know to to attain the rock certification really because our baseline was already you know about five of our ranches were already certified by dynamic everything's organic and the ones that weren't certified by dynamic already we utilized sheep mm. we've already integrated animals so really the based on equivalencies and such, having the organic is a necessity for rock. And then the biodynamic gives you the animal integration piece, which mm -hmm. is a requirement. So really it became about the social welfare, mm -hmm. um, the, the, sorry, the social pillar within rock, which is, which is one of kind of the things that sets the rock cert apart. I guess that's repetitive rock cert, but the certification through the ROA. Um, yeah. And so really it was, it was just about main, making sure. And because we're a B Corp, those things were already taken care of. We just had to then kind of prove and show the auditor and the inspector and such through the reports and such that we were doing all the things that were required. So for us, where we started from, it was a relatively, well, relatively painless uh, move yeah. to, to that next step. Um, I think it would really depend on your starting point though. You know, mm -hmm. if you weren't already organic or you weren't already integrating animals. So there's, mm -hmm. there's some more things to do, but for us, yeah. it's pretty easy. Yeah, definitely. And can you elaborate just, just for establishing a baseline here, organic certification is a prerequisite for rock. Um, what is, what's the main differentiation between organic viticulture and regenerative organic viticulture? Yeah, you know, it's so again, I think starting with the, the baseline being a certified organic operation. So essentially, really, the, the organic the through the NLP is asking for um, 
soil management practices that increase the health, increase the organic matter, increase the resilient, excuse me, resilience of the system already. So that as a baseline, those I think they both have that in common that we're really looking crop rotation, you know, using non-synthetic inputs and such. Um, I think they're they're aligned there. What I think Rock has done is a couple things. One is to kind of codify or um, give a, a more solid definition of this regenerative, right? Because we see it everywhere. I think you just mentioned that in the beginning, right? Regenerative now is like the new sustainable. Everybody's regenerative, like everybody's sustainable or something, right? Um, so in some ways kind of define it with some, some, uh, some like definite parameters that then can be, you know, uh, like verified. So like yeah. verified parameters. One is integrating animals. The organic system doesn't require that in integration of animals. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other piece is ensuring that all labor is paid a living wage, not a minimum wage, but a living wage as defined by Harvard. Um, and also that there's a grievance uh, process. So if someone has an issue with their employer, manager, whomever it is, that they can feel safe and secure to bring that up without feeling any kind of fear of repercussion. Mm -hmm. And so those, we, we've, we've all read the horror stories in the news, right? That often farm workers, farm laborers and such don't have these protections. So I think it's really to codify that piece as well, seeing that the way we're treating our land, we should also be treating our animals and our people in this same way of kind of, of, of respect, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, just wanna establish these baselines because this is, the certifications exist so that we can convey this story to the consumer. And I think we're definitely living in an age where we have access to the internet, which is a huge luxury. And the average consumer, if they so desire to, they can, in most cases, actually have an idea of what um, the type of food that they're sourcing, where it's coming from, what type of operation, um, if they choose to do so. And a lot of situations, which I'm kind of getting ahead of myself into the next part of this conversation, but in a lot of situations, the consumer has to pay more for that luxury. And with Bonterra, it's not necessarily the case. Your guys' wine is, you have tiers, but um, you do have wine that's a very approachable price point. And that's something that I'm really fascinated about. We'll move into that in a little bit, but I just already <laughs> segued myself, so. <laughs> um, Davis, do you have any um, questions or comments after the presentation? Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation, Joseph. Wonderful. Um, I really like the point about honoring complexity. I think that takes, um, I think that means humility. I think that means reverence. And I just appreciate those aspects of um, being a producer or a grower. Um, I don't know. It just, it's a little bit more reflective and a little bit more of putting ourselves in our right place. And I, I really have a lot of respect for that. Um, I was curious just uh, on the, while we're wrapping up the part of the different certifications, you guys mentioned on your website um, that you're America's number one organic winery. And I think that's uncontested with the uh, different items that you mentioned there. Is there one in particular that you go off of to measure um, that you are number one? Um, is that a size? Is that um, yeah, tell me a little bit more about how you measure that point. Right. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I appreciate you pulled something that I don't have a solid metric on. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, I think, I think, I think getting the um, the award, right, being awarded by wine enthusiasts, which is probably the most renowned wine industry publication, um, for sure, definitely set us up there. Another piece, you know, you look at the brand production, we're about 500,000 cases, uh, five to six, I should say. Um, so the volume certainly would be another parameter. And then when we look, you know, our, our inter not internal, but our, our data as far as um, IRI, numerator type data, what, what, are, what are shoppers purchasing? You know, we continue to see we're outpacing the category whether it's the price point category, whether it's the varietal category, wherever it is. So I think in those ways, it's like the, the fire that, you know, um, that the, the consumer feels basically for Bonterra, you sure. know? So it, it, it certainly wasn't like the most acreage, um, but I think all those components being just like the go-to, you know, we, we have such a, a great trajectory and 
and sales um, really beyond the, all these other uh, kind of like, you know, accolades. Absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned your consumers uh, and as we transition now into the second part of the conversation, uh, where are your customers getting Bonterra wines? Is it, um, is it mostly retail in the grocery or liquor store or is it mostly um, in restaurants? So where are your customers getting Bonterra wines primarily? Yeah, that, that's good. We, we really, um, I'd say the, the major channel would be the retail channel. We're, we're widely distributed throughout the U.S., even international. So any of your larger um, grocery stores, chains and such, any of the uh, drug stores and such, CVS, Walmart or Walgreens, whomever, you know, I, I don't want to give too many names, but um, basically the retail channel is huge. And the on-premise is, is another big component. So that would be, you know, if you go to, say, a restaurant or, or a hotel and consume there on site. So the, the on-premise channel then would be the second um, and then we certainly have some some online presence. Uh, there's there's certainly some some online sale, but I, I'd say the retail channel mostly, um, and especially since the the pandemic, you know that that on premise certainly suffered as restaurants and and other places were shut down. Um, so that that is making a comeback, uh, but really I'd say the retail channel is number one. Okay, and just to take a step back briefly. Um, you talked about the management and importance of native flora and fauna. Can you give us an example of how you are creating space for those native flora and fauna on the vineyard and what that looks like? Yeah, for sure. So the, I, I'll go with the second example first. Um, so McNabb, which is one of our ranches, um, kind of mid midway up the 101 um, it's about 350 acres is the land holding and 146 is planted mm. so there's a huge amount there that that is not you know uh, planted to vineyard so the wildlands are, are kept uh, the trees and the shrubs and such you know um, there's some degree of of cleaning up that takes place in those areas, but but they're left basically to, to be wild. Um, this photo, that's my backdrop. This is a top of Butler. Um, and so another one of our ranches, this one, we own 750 acres, 86 of which is planted. So, you know, there's, there's some huge, out of the 900 that I said was under vine, we own about 2,500 acres. So of the total. So there's a, there's a lot of, um, kind of the outskirts being left and not developed into vineyard. And then even within the vineyard, there's some footprints of some, some like riparian zones being managed and cared for, cleaned up and such, or some other um, insectary type hedgerows and things that are, that are planted as well. Yeah, I would imagine that being an organic vineyard having those buffers that are also doubling as native habitat would be beneficial to the integrity of the wine and the fact that you are organic and perhaps some of these branches are surrounded by perhaps conventional or non-organic agriculture. Yeah, it's a little different in Mendo. Um, in, in Napa, I started out in Napa in the wine world and, and you're kind of yeah, shoulder to shoulder, if you will, with neighbors, uh, often conventionally farmed neighbors. And in Mendocino, um, most of our neighbors are the wildlands, the woods and forests and such, so that that buffer strip is, is a little less important um, for, just per the kind of the development of the county. It's, um, it's, it's a bit more wild. Gotcha. Okay, well, now, since we've already gotten ahead of ourselves, I think that we'll kind of <laughs> move into the marketing portion of this um, of this discussion. So Bonterra has an amazing commercial, which I didn't want to risk film it or broadcasting it today because of internet, um, but it's called Taste Like Saving the Planet. And it's almost kind of a parody, but at the same time has a lot of truth in it. Um, it's like a minute and 30 seconds and it's on YouTube. So anyone who wants to watch it can go and watch it. But it's basically people comparing sustainability, regenerative, um, organic practices to notes of the wine, like they're <laughs> that they can taste it in the wine, which I think is a great portrayal of the, I mean, it's almost like a parody because it's like, okay, we're, these words are becoming such a 
such buzzwords and um, maybe people don't even necessarily know the meaning behind them if they're not delving into it and spending a lot of time researching. Um, but at the same time, they do represent a greater, a greater practice that um, has been evolving and gaining more and more momentum over time. So yeah, I'm just kind of interested in that conversation. And um, also, so we have great friends from Regenerate Nebraska. They they have um, a farm up in Oakland, Nebraska, and they found a bottle of Fonterra wine at a fill and chill out there. And there's that's a town of like maybe a thousand people and it's super rural. It's like an hour and a half away from the nearest large town and they found organic wine there. And so we're just kind of amazed at how you can do that because in Nebraska, especially in these warm rural areas, we're not used to having those options. I mean, we're a lot of us are living in food deserts and that's kind of the irony of it all is that this is agricultural lands and a lot of people are farming out here, but we don't have access to healthy nutrient dense food. And so I'm really intrigued at how Bonterra is able to, to reach such a wide and, um, and diverse group of people and how you're able to achieve that approachable price point. So can you just kind of give us a bit of an overview on how Bonterra has done that and the marketing strategy and what sets that strategy apart from other people selling wine? Sure, yeah, that's that's a lot. Let me see, if I miss any, just come back to it, okay? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So first the commercial, yeah, I think it's pretty hilarious. It was really trying to poke some fun at kind of the snobbiness oftentimes of wine and you know, show that there's a different purpose. There can be uh, more to the wine than whatever the notes you get off of the, the aroma and such. So, um, but really important that how we, so as far as the, you know, I, I think that's amazing that Phil and Chill has Bonterra. So yeah, props to Phil and Chill and the distributor um, and whoever the salesperson is, I got that in there, I appreciate that. So, um, <laughs> It, it is what we find is that we have positioned ourselves not necessarily to be in the organic aisle of any adult beverage retailer. So about 10 or so years ago, we tried to shift where we're set up. So oftentimes it's like the dusty corner over there where the organic wine is or whatever, and not very many people frequent that. So what our approach has been, if you focus on quality and consistency and an incredible, like you said, approachable price point, then, you know, we'd rather be in the conventional set, put us in a conventional set so that people, whether you care that it's organic or not, you buy it because it's good and it's great price point. And every time you pick up the bottle, you know it's gonna be good and a great price point. And so that kind of shifts, the, you know, there's a bit of, some people are really interested in organic, some people aren't. And some people have been burned by some maybe less than optimal organic wines in the past. There was almost like a trade-off. It was like, you can have a good wine or you can have an organic wine and you're doing something good for the planet, but it might not taste great. It might be too expensive, you know, and, and we don't feel that there's any need for that trade-off. We can produce organic grapes, organically grown grapes made with organic wines with an amazing price point and great quality. And a lot of that has to do with the operations really, as far as that price point. As I said, I started the, my wine world in, in Napa and um, it was a bit different, you know, when you're, when you're growing fruit for a hundred to five hundred dollar bottle of wine, you know your farming practices can be a bit different. Um, you can do things a little differently. When when I got to Mendocino, it's really about an incredible amount of efficiency. You know how can we really efficiently do this organically? Um, and I think that's one of the that's one of the things that drew me to Bonterra to come to Organa sorry, to come to Montero to work was that, you know, I, I didn't really agree that only, you know, only if you can afford to for a $500 bottle of wine, did you get to have a biodynamic or organic produced wine, you know, so, so to me, it, it's amazing that we've been able to um, produce something consistently at a quality at a price point that is quite approachable. And, and that has 
come. You know, we have an incredible amount of of knowledge and experience on on all sides of the business that really allow that. So there there is real no you know there's there's no room for inefficiency. I'll say at that price point. Um, so we are definitely uh, really kind of keyed into all the detail to make sure that we we can do this well consistently. I might have missed the rest of your question if there were. No, no, that was great. No, I think the, the emphasis on efficiency is it's really interesting that you bring that up because just last week we had Kelly Mulville of Bacinus Ranch. He came on and, and spoke about livestock integration, about having sheep in his vineyards. And he talked about if you can train the the vine to grow in a way that it's out of reach of the sheep, the sheep can actually do some of the work that human laborers would have to do. And mm -hmm. in turn, having sheep out there is more efficient and cost effective than actually having to pay people to come out to, to cut the suckers and to, to trim the edges of the vines. And so I thought that was super interesting. And you definitely see that a lot in, in livestock integration. I mean, you're also getting the deposit of, of dung and urine which acts as fertilizer and and that eliminates another pass of a tractor or a human and it just maximizes that efficiency if you can do it well and if you can design your your farm in a way that actually allows for that to happen and so I think that that's really interesting and and the fact that that also allows you to obviously the efficiency allows you to have a product which is more which has a more approachable price point. Um, yeah, Davis, do you have any yeah. questions after that initial introduction or? Go ahead, Joseph, did you have something? Yeah, I was, I was just gonna say really, you know, it, it is, it kind of comes down to that systems approach and the whole systems approach. So when you look at the whole farm system and you find where are the efficiencies and where can you eliminate passes or reduce you know, the, the inputs or, or, or the passes, like you said. And, and I think the, the point of designing the system, training the vine. So that's what we've done too. In the last, we started, we regularly do replants and, and about 2015, I started replanting a lot of the older vineyards. And at that point, it was obvious that we were gonna be using sheep no matter what now, like we've been using them for, for I don't know, seven, eight years at that point. Um, and so, you know, we have a drip line Typically the drip line was about 16 or so inches off the ground, but as sheep are sheep and just act like sheep, if one decides I'm running that way full speed for some reason, I don't know why, but I'm doing it in the middle of a vineyard, then all of them decide they're running full speed that way. I don't know why, you know, in the middle of the vineyard. And so then a lot of drip stuff gets, gets broken and such. So instead of trying to like retrain 3000 sheep every year, we just raise the drip line, right? So if you can design the system around these efficiencies and integrating animals, then, you know, the sheep are happier, we're happier, less repair. And, and they do, um, I would say they limit, even only if you're using them early season, they eliminate, I'd say two to three tractor passes. So that's tractor maintenance, tractor fuel, right? Driver time, like a lot of costs and add fertility. Yeah. Right. A diesel burning tractor, it does an amazing amount of work, but yet have we found a way for a diesel burning tractor to add fertility in its own metabolic process? <laughs> if you will. So, yeah. 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 I don't have a question to add to that, but the, the perspective of why not both, it seems to be coming up again and again within this conversation, uh, starting out in the context of the wine consumer choosing, not having to choose between good quality and um, affordable, uh, they can have both. Uh, and now as we transition into this, it seems like we don't have to trade efficiency for very high quality, the utmost quality, uh, it can be both. We can have both at the same time. So I just like that theme that keeps resurfacing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it is. It is about kind of understanding that complexity, you know, like you mentioned that is as we honor the complexity, then we're able to find these kind of interactions and and support them so that it isn't this like always thinking about like a give and take like well we can have this but we can't have that so it's, it's really about finding those ways where we can come together um 
kind of a you know a synergy between the the systems living systems yeah do you have any other um specific examples where you've been able to design the day-to-day -day work and the actual physical design of the farm for maximum efficiency because i think that i think that um i mean obviously a lot of farms have existed for a long time and design doesn't play a huge role in a lot of agricultural practices. So I'm intrigued to see if you have any more insight on that. Yeah, there's, there's, I'd say a, a few just overall. Um, often the timing is, is so critical. I think all farmers would agree timing is critical. We find it maybe even more so in organic biodynamic on the regenerative side, because some of the, the materials, right, that you're going to use if you have a pest or disease issue, we don't have the same. So we basically are, are on the prevention side. We really need to prevent it first. Um, but but I think, um, so if we can time some of our passes, a tucking pass, a wire move, then we can eliminate one or two other passes later. If we can time a leafing pass just right, then we don't have to make two or three passes. So a lot of the, the hand labor is a huge cost for all of us, I would say. And so if we can find ways to time it and do it, in such an approach that we can do it once instead of twice or once instead of three times it's a huge savings um, another piece for me i can't stand these little rows of like three four or five vines or something that drives me absolutely crazy we're farming nearly a thousand acres we do not I, I do not have a row with less than 15 or 20 vines so that's one thing that as i've replanted i would go through a, even if i wasn't replanting start pulling things out i'm not driving a tractor all the way up and down for five vines, right? So there's like some some bigger kind of shifts and then some really smaller shifts too, because at the end of the day, those five vines are not worth the little bit of fruit that they're gonna give you. They're on the end already. They're gonna get missed. That's where the things usually attack and you're still running you know, a fair amount of labor and machine hours on something that doesn't really give you that return. So um, I think in the design of the, the farm itself, uh, as you look at how you orient your rows is another great example. So the longer runs you can make, um, you know, so there's ways to just design the layout of the vineyard, whether it's row orientation, row length, cross arm spacing, how you do your wires, whether movable or adjustable or, or permanent. I mean, there's there's like so many, I think each area, each, each, each task needs to kind of be understood in its its purpose. And then like what comes before and what comes after too, to see if there's some way that things can be modified to, to eliminate some passes or to make things more efficient. Yeah, definitely. Um, so next question, how has consumer behavior, and obviously it's changed a lot, but how has it changed since the pandemic and how has Bonterra's marketing strategy adjusted? And you already spoke a little bit about on-premise and off-premise, but, um, I was curious if there's anything more to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the, one of the wonderful things I'd say about the our industry the wine industry or even adult beverage is that when things are good people drink to celebrate and things are bad they drink to commiserate you know so like you're <laughs> somebody's gonna be buying it for one reason or another yeah um but i do think oh hold on one second here um sorry i got the harmonica in the background um so i i think uh one one of the areas there is is that consumers clearly went out less right so we already spoke to that how the on-premise channel really shifted considerably um a lot of that shifted to the off-premise so a lot of you know instead of going out say a night or two a week or whatever then people were just buying more wine at home so so that certainly increased here <laughs> just trying to trying to serenade me with the harmonica um <laughs> let's see uh i forgot where i was the the other you know the other piece i think there was maybe a greater awareness and consciousness of what we're putting in our bodies and so though it's always kind of well not maybe not always but for a while now there's been like an interest in say organic baby food often organic dairy organic produce um wine 
has this like amazing place in human consciousness where it's like amazingly romantic and just grapes, right? And that unfortunately is not the case. Um, so uh, I think people started to understand that like there's a lot that goes into conventional wine in the farming of it and in the creation of it. So those, those inputs, those additives and such, maybe people became more aware, more conscious of wanting to reduce or eliminate. Um, and I think as far as we go, I, you know, when, one of the kind of this foundations of us is this, this purpose and this integrity and this like transparency. So I'm not sure that we really did a whole lot different other than just kind of sticking to the foundation of being transparent and open. You know, that's why we have like a litany of certifications, right? We, we do these things, we claim them, and then we have the certification to back it up. That's coming from a third party and outside audit, not us. So for us, really, I think it was really more about like people coming around to appreciating more and more these kind of stances and, and these, you know, these, these ways that we are pretty open about what we do and how we do it. Um, so I, I think that's becoming more, more acknowledged and more appreciated. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, and to kind of segue off of that, in your opinion, what do you think is going to continue to happen in the regenerative organic space as time goes on? And if the momentum that you just spoke of continues to build? Yeah, you know, I mean, hopefully there, I guess for me, the the marketplace is such that farmers then feel confident and secure however we any of us could feel secure i guess it's a funny little thing but um An to, to yeah right to really increase this type of management right i think i think when the market demands um or the market shows that it's open and willing to pay for things then producers shift and so I think we kind of need that shift coming from multiple maybe you know multiple levers if you will pulling on that shift and so I think as consumers understand um, and demand it as producers see that there's a lot of benefit uh, with reducing inputs with you know investing in the soil in the long term that's kind of our, our long-term account really is is our own resource and how do we steward the land and the resource um, for the long term more than just kind of a, a short term game which gain I think which has maybe been a bit of the approach in the last few decades or, or more now um, so I think we're we're seeing that the way we've been operating doesn't necessarily work um, as far as how we treat our people and our land and such we really need to make a, a change so I, I think as as that changes, it just kind of perpetuates itself, right? More products become available, more producers do it, more more research, more understanding, more knowledge comes about about how we can do it well and, and efficiently. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, unless Davis, do you have any more comments? I think I'm going to move into q and I I do have just one more. I want the audience questions, but I do have one question that I want to ask. Uh, your your work in advocacy. Uh, first off, thank you. As uh, as other partakers in regenerative agriculture, we really appreciate your advocacy. I'm uh, just curious to hear a little bit more about your work there. What things in particular you are trying to advocate for, and then how we can think about as a body of farmers, a collective body, and how we each have our roles in um, accomplishing a goal. Uh, one of yours seems to be advocacy, and how can we think about uh, how to work together as that body of farmers, I'll call it, and what our respective roles might be? Right. Yeah, that's great. I, it's, it's new to me. I mean, the last few years now, but but this is not my background in, in advocacy, political science, any of these things, government relations. I, so it, it's a lot of learning. Um, one, we've been working with Ceres, which is an incredible organization um, the last few years. So a lot of this policy work and a lot of the advocacy days are, are coordinated um, by Ceres. And so in this way, there's uh, many businesses, I was gonna try to give you a number, but I forgot now, uh, many businesses that, that are really seeking to 
to get the support of policymakers because we've all done as much as we possibly can, you know, in many ways, maybe there's more to be done, but a lot. Um, and so really, as we can come together with kind of common goals, you know, so maybe farm bills, a common goal or, or advocating for some of the healthy soils programming or these climate smart agriculture programs and such, you know, uh, technical assistance, oftentimes we, you know, the, our technical assistance providers may not be all that well versed in in organic biodynamic regenerative type practices you know so it's like really pushing on all these these different areas and collectively i think that's a really great point that you make is that collectively i think the voice is certainly stronger and and policymakers respond they believe it or not they want to hear from you they want to hear from constituents they want to hear from business they want to do i think we're all trying to do the best we can with what we know you know so whatever realm we're working in um so really i think kind of joining some of these orgs we're also a part of the organic trade association so a trade association that way is for us specifically focused on organic but you know as we come together and, and maybe find kind of the common ground and the areas that we we can align on i'm sure we have differences but if we all, right, at some point, we all want to save farms and farmlands and farmers and have a future of farming in the nation. Like we, this is not something we want to export. I had an economics professor, my senior year of econ economics, basically tell me the United States should not be producing food anymore. They should be like doing higher, more important things. And that blew my mind. I was like, are you kidding me? That, right? Like that, that's insane to think. Um, but, you know, based on his like, uh, I don't know, arithmetic or whatever but but really i think we we know that the future of our nation depends on that that's the foundation our soil right and our farms and having a longevity of farmers and farming communities and and children wanting to take on the farm not being like peace i'm out i'm going to the city you know like that that and that's not great for the long term i mean everyone has the right to their individual choice of course but but wouldn't it be great if there was a lot more incentive to to a a good life in farming um mm -hmm. so i think that's kind of where i don't know if i skirted the question or not but i think that's where we uh, kind of want to come together mm -hmm. absolutely yeah yeah i completely agree i mean davis and i are in one of the most rural places that you can get and this is where green cover is based so there's actually a ton of opportunity here and and i'm a young person in in agriculture and i don't know many others like me and uh, i do think that there is tons of opportunity and like you said it's we just need to band together to create more opportunities for people to have a good living in agriculture and then we will be able to grow more of our own food and more nutrient dense food, hopefully. <laughs> um, so let's go into questions here. I thought this question was interesting. Um, this person is asking if you find that wildlife um, goes after the grapes at a higher rate than perhaps conventionally grown because of the lack of synthetic inputs. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great question. And I, I have zero research. I can give you a couple anecdotes, though. Mm -hmm. So we find a lot of uh, a lot of uh, I don't know, a lot, a fair amount of grape farmers have some bird issues. Birds create a good amount of damage, especially starlings will come and they'll just start pecking, pecking, pecking. Um, for us, it's rarely ever an issue or maybe never an issue. I've never, not in Mendocino. So I think a lot of the wildlands kind of help, you know, there's hawks and there's eagles and there's like falcons and such. So I, I think that natural diversity, again, like because it's not just like a huge block of a monoculture of grapes, right? So that that is one kind of anecdote that I've noticed that we don't really have the same bird pressure. Um, and then the bear. So we have a bear, well, a family or families of bear up here at this Butler Ranch that this, this, this photo, my backdrop. Um, and every year, nearly without fail, the bears go after the Movedra. The Movedra is in this little block way down outside of nowhere, hard to get to. And for whatever reason, you see prints everywhere. Like, it's not like the bear doesn't just go all over the ranch. You see their tracks all over. But every year, the bear loves the Movedra. So I don't know if it's like has anything to do with like conventional neighbors or not, but I can tell you that 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 bear is like really into their Rhone type blends and loves Mavedra more than any other fruit we grow. Um, it's a it's a super great question. I, I really have zero research to back up if you know what the conventional guys are 
excuse me, folks are, are dealing with. Um, yeah. But it's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question. What, I mean, you hear a lot about how insects will attack lower bricks plants. And so I would think that if you're a regenerative operation that's focusing on soil health, your fruit would be higher bricks and then you would have more insect resiliency or, I mean, no issues at all. It's, is that the case or have you seen anything like that? Yeah, so, you know, really as far as insect issues, I mean, I'd say first off, we're in Northern California, so it's kind of unfair. I mean, it's like the most perfect climate for growing wine grapes, really, you know, so the the, the pressures already are pretty minimal. Um, as far as insects go, the only one we really have an issue with is an uh, imported, you know, a, a non native non-local insect this little leaf hopper that for some reason i get the blame for it's called the virginia creeper leaf hopper so <laughs> i guess my virginia roots have uh, implicated me in that but um but for the most part really i think it's the kind of the natural system of you know having a diversity of crop on the land having cover crops having riparian zones having these insectary rows and such that really help to mitigate kind of balance it's not like we don't have any insects we want insects we've got a ton of insects right but as far as like the like an ipm perspective like the economic threshold it, it, it really isn't there. It doesn't hardly ever warrant a spray except for maybe this one leaf hopper. Um, and that leaf hopper is just, I think is like, you know, I, I, I don't know if you ever experienced like the person in the dorm that like never got out when they were in high school. And next thing you know, they're like, ah, going crazy. It's almost like that little leaf hopper is like, yeah, you know? So um, other than that, there's, there's a really fair balance I say that that it not to the like damaging of crop level as far as insects go okay good well that's fortunate for you <laughs> <laughs> so I think your audio kind of broke up a bit during your presentation when you were talking about cover crops this person is asking if you're planting them in the rows under the vines right yeah that's that's a good question the majority of our cover crop is seeded with a drill so it'd be a seed drill you know not technically a drill but you know what i'm saying right so it's really just within the middles um things fall out things reseed a lot of the clovers will self-seed and, and end up under the middle but we don't really do very rarely any kind of like a broadcast seeding um so basically it's the drill and the drill just goes down the middle um of, of the row okay so this question, um, this is kind of a hard question. I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, but they're asking your opinion. Um, so they're citing that you were talking about how critical government policy reform is in, in order to drive regenerative agriculture to the next level. They're asking, how is that playing out? And then the secondary question is, can we rely on government to drive this or do we need to focus on educating the consumer who vote with the dollars that they spend? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, a couple great points. Um, I, you know, for many years, one of the greatest lessons I'd say from economics was a professor told us you vote with your dollar. Every time you make a purchase, you're voting for that producer, that essentially distributor, that wholesaler, that retailer, the whole chain, right? You're saying, yes, we want more of this. Um, so I, and that is usually what I would tell people um, and even still do right? There's a way to make a difference as a consumer is that you buy the things that you want to see continuing. Um, so I totally agree with that. And I, I do think the consumer education awareness is huge. I, I think that's a really important part. That's why I do these things and I'm on the road and I'm trying to talk and, you know, be out there for mm -hmm. folks to, to better understand. And there's a lot of folks that, I mean, you guys are hosting these webinars and such. So, so I, I think I'd say that I wouldn't necessarily put it like in a in a in a dichotomous position. I don't know that I would polarize the two in that way. That it's like this or that. I think that at this point in time, it's got to be all of it. I, I don't think it can be one or the other um, right now. I think that we've come to a place where it has to be all the above. Uh, as far as policy can help drive change. Um, and consumers can help drive change. And I believe we need them both. Mm -hmm. um, hi, yeah. Sorry, I've got a little visitor here. <laughs> and then uh, as far as how's it going, 
you know, it's, I mean, I don't know. It's like the, the growth of an oak tree or something, right? Like day by day, you barely notice it, but you know, 10 years later, you're like, Oh, that tree actually grew. Um, so I think that's the nature of it, right? It's, it's, there's been some big wins, I would say, especially recently, you know, there's, there's been some, some money going towards some, some things that we feel are, are worthwhile as far as organic agriculture and, um, technical assistance and transitions and such so you know i i certainly understand that there's you know some hesitancy around government interactions and such and um i can i can understand that i i do think that it is an important part though really because there's going to be government support for something mm -hmm. right so in my mind that's it i i don't i don't think uh that government is going to solve all the problems or or many maybe even but if there's going to be money put towards something let's get a portion of that money put towards regenerative agriculture yeah, right? mm -hmm. yeah definitely okay i think we're going to wrap things up because we're already five minutes over davis do you have any closing <laughs> thoughts or joseph anything else that you'd like to share i don't have anything else uh, joseph really appreciate everything that you shared both in the presentation and the answers uh, very thoughtful and uh, thought provoking for me. Great. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot more to add. I, I could, but we're out of time. So yeah. let me, uh, I appreciate the invite here. Yeah. It's been great talking to both of you. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out, you know, if things come up, questions or ideas, I'm happy to continue discussing. So thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for giving us a great presentation. All right, guys, next week, we're going to have um, Dale Strickler come on to talk about building drought resilience. So go to our webinars page to get registered for that. And then we will see you next week. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye.